Hello, it's a beautiful Saturday evening here in Accra and this is our last bulletin for the day. Over the next 30 minutes we'll be bringing you the very latest news wrap live from the news hub at Adesawe Kanda. Across the globe you can follow our live stream on Facebook and on 3news.com. And a uh, demolished slum around the Red Coast flat at Medina is to be developed into a market and lorry park. The project, according to the Lang Kwantanang Medina Municipal Assembly, will provide alternative businesses locations for traders and drivers along the Medina Adenta Road. And President Kufuado says the use of some of Ghana's oil revenue to fund the free Sina high school policy, which is guaranteeing that all uh, Ghanaian school growing children access to senior high school education is appropriate. President Kufuado disclosed this on Friday when he delivered the keynote address at the 2018 Oxford African Conference, University of Oxford in the United Kingdom. And insanitary conditions are the Malamata market in Accra is exposing traders and the public to cholera. Traders complain they pay daily tolls to the local assembly to collect waste, but this has not been done. The Ghana Health Service during the week warned of a poss possible cholera outbreak for the onset of the rains. On community protection personnel have been advised to eschew acts of corruption and other social vices which can damage the image of the Ghana Police Service. The Volta Regional Minister Archibald Yao Lecha gave the advice when he reviewed the passing out parade of some CPP activists at Ho in the Volta region. And elsewhere, Sierra Leone's President Julius Madabi on Saturday promised in his inaugural speech to provide disciplined and inclusive leadership. Bio, who was elected after a hotly contested election on March 31st, sworn in to President April 4th, was inaugurated Saturday in a colorful ceremony at the Siaka Stevens Stadium in Freetown. Welcome back to our very first story. The Ghana Health Service has warned of a possible cholera outbreak or the onset of the rains. The public uh, have been advised to take personal precautions to prevent infection. In the following report, Catherine Frimpoma exposes the insanitary conditions in some markets and the serious health implications it poses to the public. Most markets in Accra are well structured However, the population of traders by the roadside is huge. It unfortunately remains the preferred choice for many due to the easy access and affordability. Conditions here at the Malamata markets are worrying. In the midst of this very dirty, smelly place, all manner of vegetables, fruits and other commodities are traded. Traders here are not oblivious of the health implications. Oh, well, you drunk one, you did our food is always contaminated by flies, but we don't have an option. They blamed the Metropolitan Assembly of neglecting their duty to clear the refuse even though they pay. We pay not less than 10 cities a day, yet they do not come to clear them. We are tired of this filth here. They gather a lot of revenue from us, but yet they do nothing. Not too far from this is a public toilet. 
people go in and out and without washing their hand, they go straight to serve customers. The Ghana Health Service has cautioned the public to ensure cholera is prevented since Ghana will be getting to the peak season, especially during the rainy season. Cholera is an acute watery diarrheal disease that can kill within hours if left untreated. It is caused by eating food or drinking water contaminated with a bacterium called Vibro cholerae. But these women say people eat fruit here immediately after buying without washing them. The mangoes are exposed to flies. You have to wash with salty water or risk being sick. Cholera can be prevented by improved environmental sanitation, personal hygiene and drinking safe water, and frequent hand washing with soap and running water. Ghana experienced its highest cholera outbreak in 2014 when the Ghana Health Service recorded a total of 28,975 cases with 243 deaths. This indeed is another heartbreaking event waiting to happen. Catherine Frimpoma, TV3, Accra. On the chief of naval staff, Rear Admiral Kofi uh, Fay has called for the enhanced sub-regional naval co collaboration to combat maritime crime. Speaking at the 20, 2008 Biennial Conference of Naval Staff for Navy Forces in West Africa, the Chief of Naval Staff said lack of coordination among stakeholders is derailing efforts to fight crime. The Chief of Naval Staff, Rear Admiral Peter Kofi Fedu, said one of the critical equipment needed for the patrol along the various maritime domains was a dedicated marine patrol aircraft, which none of the countries in the region have. He added this is affecting the fight against off-cross-boundary maritime crimes. The collaboration I'm talking about is that we should, between us and Togo and Benin, to tell them that, look, these guys are, are criminals and they are in your waters. Please give us permission to, to pursue them into your waters. That's what we want to do. We do not have maritime patrol aircraft at this time. Um, the aircraft, our pilots are very good. They are able to go there. It's not really um, a good thing to do because you must have special uh, planes for that. But, you know, under our circumstances, they do their best. Uh, so when it happens like this, if there's a country which has that asset, and in this case, as I said, Portuguese had, uh, none of the, uh, the navies in our sub-region has that. Chief of Naval Staff Fidu also called upon all local stakeholders in marine-related businesses, the fishing community and merchants to help security agencies with boats and logistics to patrols. The opening ceremony of the conference, which is themed Maritime Terrorism, training and equipping the Ghana Navy against evolving maritime threats, brought together key personnel from the Navy, Air Force, Ghana Maritime Authority, Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority, and district heads of all security agencies. And President Tukufuado says the use of some of Ghana's oil revenue to fund the free senior high school policy, which is guaranteeing all Ghanaian school going, of school going age access to senior high school education, is appropriate. President Tukufuado disclosed this on Friday when he delivered the keynote address at the 2018 Oxford Africa Conference at the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom. President Nikofo Ado said as a result of the implementation of the free senior high school policy, his government is laying a strong foundation for an educated and skilled workforce of the future. We are laying a strong foundation for an educated and skilled workforce of the future through my government's policy of free senior high school. We're using some of the income from our all revenue to fund the program. I believe strongly that this is the most equitable and transparent use of the oil revenue instead of it finding its way into the pockets of politicians or bureaucrats. We're investing in our future scientists, engineers, modern farmers, innovators, entrepreneurs and transformation agents. 
This year, the Kufu Ados government has announced it will spend 453 million cities of Ghana's oil revenue on funding of Free Senior High School, more than double the amount spent last year on funding the policy. Addressing the gathering on the theme, enough rhetoric, catalyzing an era of concrete action, the president stated that his administration has embarked on shifting the emphasis in education to ensure that science, technology, engineering and mathematics Matters drive all sectors of the economy. Touching on the issue of trade, President Kufuado stated that the ratification of the Continental Free Trade Agreement by the Ghanaian Parliament will mean that the era of low volumes of intracontinental trade that have defined the activities of African economies will come to an end. He noted, with Africa's population set to increase from 1.2 billion to 2 billion in 20 years' time, an increase in intra-regional trade in Africa is the surest way to develop fruitful relations between between African countries. This market, he explained, will present immense opportunities to bring wealth and prosperity to the African people with hard work, integrity, innovation and enterprise. This is still News at 10. We're live from the News Hub at Adesawe Kanda in Accra. You can follow our live stream on Facebook and on 3 We'll be right back. Please stay. Welcome back. Now, a reeling and uh, massive debt. The Gambia's new leadership, led by Adama Baro, is selling several planes and a fleet of luxury cars left behind by former President Yahya Jame to settle some of the country's debts. The planes and cars are those the former dictator could not send with him on exile in Equatorial Guinea when he lost power last year and refused to hand over until he was forced to by West African leaders. They include three planes and a fleet of luxury cars and mansions he's left behind. According to the International Monetary Fund, the Gambia remains a fragile state with significant developmental and infrastructural gaps. At the end of 2017, the country's debt stock stood at 130% of GDP, although the economy grew by 3.5%, just 2.2% a year earlier. Right, let's get on to the telephone lines. Uh, most of our car is a political analyst, uh, joins us now. Uh, good evening, sir. Thank you. We're grateful you could join us. So uh, has the government, uh, the Gambian government, been able to locate all these luxury cars and planes? Um, well, thank you. It's been a, a long time since I spoke to you on the program, and it's a pleasure to be back. Um, obviously, most of these luxury cars uh, could not, we are actually in, in the country. Um, so, they, 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 Jamia could not uh, be able to take them to Equatorial Guinea. For the planes, uh, I know for sure too that uh, some of them, I cannot confirm that all of them are located in the country, but the information that we are receiving is that uh, there are some of them in the country. Some of them are actually in the country right now. So how, how many uh, luxury cars are we talking about? You've just said about three planes, but uh, the number of luxury cars, do we know? Uh, there, were, there, were, there were many. The last count, um, according to information that was revealed, was that there were around 30. But um, this was not confirmed. There are various numbers, but that's the most, uh, that's the most circulated number. Interesting. And these were used by Yahya Jame uh, exclusively whilst he was in power or it was used by himself and other government agencies who worked around the presidency. What exactly is the narrative uh, surrounding these 36 or so luxury vehicles and planes? You know, Jame doesn't really share anything, <laughs> I think, uh, especially things that are linked to uh, his presidency. He loved good things. He lo loved luxury. So he definitely didn't share them uh, with, with his uh, officials, even the top officials. Basically, um, they were reserved for himself. Then uh, how, how much are these uh, vehicles and plane worth? Do we know? Like, have they been valued? Uh, we have not received information that they have been valued. But, uh, you know, Jame himself uh, is 
uh, I mean, according to what we are seeing at the current Commission of Enquiry, uh, which was established to probe um, the, the financial dealings of the former president and his close allies, what we are seeing at the Commission is that um, Jame was embezzling a lot of funds, state funds. Some of these funds we are money spent as foreign aid to the Gambia, some of which we are locally uh, uh, taken from local sources. Um, so, we, I mean, going by that, uh, we know that this, this could be very, very expensive task mm. because Jame was able to siphon the money from uh, public coffers and then use them to buy these cars. At some point in time, he went on TV, uh, on the national television, to say that um, he was not going to be poor and his children were ne um, his children and great-grandchildren would never live in poverty. And this is amazing because Jame was such a poor person in, in the sense that on the day he came to power, he told the media, these were things he revealed in the media, that on the day he came to power, he didn't even have money for lunch. I mean, so you could see how much of embezzlement that, uh, I mean, has gone on in his administration, uh, uh, overseen by him. So we assume that these um, luxury cars are very, very expensive. Because Jame himself said on state television that the designs were sent to the company by him. They were special design, not designed for anybody else but him. Interesting. I know that uh, we, we, we spoke to you about a year ago. Now, uh, Adama Barrow has been in office for a year and four months uh, since he took office. How are the Gambian people uh, assessing his presidency so far? I mean, it's one of mixed feelings. I had the opportunity to meet him about two days ago in his home village, where he is currently on holiday. Um, and uh, my meeting with him strikes me for one thing. One difference between him and Jame uh, is that he's a humble person, and I think he listens because he listened to some of the concerns that I and colleagues who went, went to meet him um, um, spoke to him about. And if you look at the economic front, he's made a lot of progress. At least the economy is much more stable because when he was coming to power, there was basically one, one, less than one month import cover. Today we are talking about uh, six months import cover. Uh, so that means that the foreign reserves have substantially increased. Um, the other uh, achievement that he's done, I think, compared to Germany, is that um, he's been able to maintain at least a level of democracy. We are not seeing the arrest that we are seeing uh, during Germany's time, and fear is gone. So people go to the media and even in the streets, um, people can, can criticize him. Uh, if you even look at the, what has happened, because today we, were, we just had elections today for local government uh, uh, councils throughout the country, and you could see that people were basically free to air their views uh, for or against the government. But again, on the other hand, there is a lot of division, as you've highlighted. Uh, there is a lot of division in the country. The country is not yet able to build the differences among the, or, uh, the various groups. Uh, also, there are also other issues. I think a lot of the reforms are yet to come. Truth and reconciliation is yet to come. Uh, we also have a lot of other challenges that are yet to be addressed. Youth unemployment. Right. Um, the youth, in fact, didn't go to vote in the current elections that I, I just spoke about, the elections that we had. Um, and, and voter turnout is also low. That means that I think that my own interpretation is that things are not uh, shaping up as, as fast as people would want to want to see them. Right. Uh, Mr. Fakar, we're grateful for your time extremely. Uh, Mr. Fakar is a political analyst in the Gambia. This is still news at 10. Away from that, Ghana has ratified uh, to, the, to host uh, international conventions that safeguard the rights of women. These have been reinforced by existing legislations and constitutional safeguards that are tailored uh, to address the peculiar needs of women. But have these helped to remedy marginalization and social exclusion? Catherine Fimpoma has been probing. Gender inequality continues to undermine local and national efforts intended to reduce poverty and promote equitable development. The intentions are right, but implementation is a challenge. Then again, there's a disconnect. Coordination of all these programs in such a way that they reach out to the people in the right way is a big, big deal. I mean, the Ministry of Health is doing a number of things under nutrition and all of that. 
the Ministry of Gender has given um, support to poor people under LEAP, and then the LEAP 1000 that goes specifically to pregnant women and children under one. But then there's very poor connection between these various institutions. The LIPW, for example, by Ministry of Local Government, they're also on their own. So how do we weave this support together to make sure that it's reaching the right target and it's building one over the other? So that's one challenge. While women contribute considerably to economic activities, access to basic necessities of life remains a challenge with those in deprived communities most affected. The benefits of social protection will yield stronger if they are linked to various programs for, for example, deliberately developed productive inclusion programs where there is that consciousness to support poor or vulnerable groups or individuals and families to engage in economic activities that are sustainable. Statistics compiled by the International Federation of Women Lawyers, FIDA, reveals single mothers and women who are heads of households struggle to survive in raising children. This can easily find itself in the Domestic Violence Act because one of the abuses under the Domestic Violence Act is the economic abuse where someone is mandated to uh, provide uh, care and maintenance. It's also in the Children's Act and the person refuses to do so. So the protections are there uh, in some situations. Uh, where the, there are children, the Children's Act is our number one act and it really frowns upon a lack of maintenance. It's actually a criminal offence. Property ownership and inheritance remains a challenge due to certain traditions and customs that are inimical to the interest of women, particularly those who bear the entire responsibility of providing for their households. FIDA, however, says there are laws and safety nets to protect women who have been victimized. Telling women that FIDA is out there, is here for all women and even men too. When they find themselves in these situations, we are telling them, come over, let's talk about it. Don't enter into any business or build uh, houses or acquire property with somebody you are not married to without first seeking legal advice. These inequalities are persistent, pervasive in many parts of the world. There is growing evidence that gender equality can directly foster economic growth and broad-based social development. Addressing inequality, therefore, is imperative to inclusive development for the marginalized and socially excluded. Catherine from TV3, Accra. And food crop farmers in the Bunahafu region say about 30% of their farm produce annually go waste due to the non-employment of modern methods of drying, preservation and storage techniques. The Bunahafu region is one of Ghana's food baskets. Our correspondent Johnson Tichi has this report. Another bad situation our reporter took keen interest to address is a drying process involved in cereal crops mostly at the Ghanaian markets. At several markets places, cereal crops are dried on cement floor on tarpaulins, while pepper and cassava are mostly dried on road shoulders and at times on the bare floor. The simple question is, could these traditional ways of drying crops really attract world markets? During bumper harvest, about 70% of watermelon goes waste in Nkranza North and South districts in the Brongahaf region. It will pity you to know that three balls of watermelon is selling at five Ghana cities and the price can be reduced to one city for one watermelon during their bumper harvest. The engineer of the mobile balloon crop dryer, Evans Peter Insia, says his intervention will help the Ghanaian crop farmer to stop traditional methods of drying and switch to modern methods of drying food crops in a very hygienic process. It's mobile, so it means it can be relocated anywhere you want it. Legumes like beans, like soybean and granite, and then we have also uh, vegetables like chili, uh, ginger, and the rest. And then we also can use it for drying herbs and tubers like cassava into cocoon tea or something like that. 
In effect, it dries a whole lot of things. So it's a multi purpose dryer. The director of Ministry of Food and Agriculture in the Techiman municipality, Eric Asmini, is hopeful the mobile balloon crop dryer can help farmers from post harvest losses. You only need to install it in an open place, void of rain, then the drying can, 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 can take place. It is a hybrid system using um, gas and uh, solar radiation uh, at the same time. So um, it's, it's a very efficient um, system that we need to, to encourage among our farmers. And that's how we wrap up with news at 10. Thank you very much uh, for making time. We have the crew. Good night and enjoy your weekend.